This is Mac Geek Ab, episode 914 for Monday, February 14th. I think that's Valentine's Day, 2022. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take your tips, your questions, your cool stuff found. We string them all together into an agenda so that we can share your tips and cool stuff found. We share some tips and cool stuff found on our, of, our, of our own and also on our own. We answer your questions or we try to, or at least we share them as geek challenges so we can all answer their questions because we are a community here. And the goal of our community when we get together every week is that we each learn at least five new things. Sponsors for this episode include BB Edit from Barebone Software, Thesis at takethesis.com slash MGG, where you will save 10%. Uh, we'll talk more about that. In fact, we'll talk more about all of these things in a minute. Uh, HunterDouglas.com slash MGG for your free style, get smarter, design guide, and the Jordan Harbinger show. So as I said, we'll talk more in depth about each of those in a minute here. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. How are we today, Mr. John F. Braun? Eh, hanging in there, you know, that's, like all That's of what us. we do. Yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's dive right into the quick tip, shall we? Donna has one that I had no idea about, and I, I love this. In fact, I think Donna's got a couple of quick tips for us. But she says, something I discovered recently, I had no idea that you could use markup uh, the iOS functionality on a photo that is already in an email draft. So you've already attached it. You've already put it in the email draft. You haven't set, hit send yet. Uh, but she says, I've always done markups in photos first uh, and then added it to an email. I did not know that you could do that. She says the option is pretty evident. Uh, when you look, there's a little markup icon in the uh, kind of up on the above the keyboard in the, in the right there. And, uh, she said, I'd just never seen it before. What gets really interesting is that you can hit that markup button, she says, when you are not on a photo and it opens a blank page that you can draw whatever you want on and insert into the email. So you can you can effectively mark up from a white background with whatever you want to do. So if you want to draw a little diagram for somebody that's easier to draw than try and tap out, you know, a description of what it might look like. Boom. There you go. So that you might have known the first quick tip. I did. The second one, I did not. So and this is what we love. So I'm already at one. Some of you might be at two. <laughs> it's beautiful. I love yeah. It. So markup is like Apple's photo editing widget, if you will. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's there's different parts of it, right? There, I mean, they have their photo touch up thing where you can change the brightness and the contrast and you know crop a photo and all that i don't think they they call that markup what they call markup is where you're literally drawing on like like mm -hmm. you know it's 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 the arlo guthrie you know the, the arrows and circles and diagrams on the back of each one kind of thing right so kids ask your parents if you're not sure what <laughs> i'm referring to but uh and and wish them happy valentine's day uh yeah so that's um that's what we got. That's yeah. So it's it's where you're literally like doing your your diagrams and and such circles. I yeah, I don't use now. it often because every photo that I take is perfect, and if it's not, I delete it. Well, right, but you <laughs> might like you might want to take a screenshot of something and mm. draw a circle around the thing that you want to point someone to, right? Like yes. like for example, you, you know, Donna actually used that in her. Uh, in her email, which I would show on the, the screen for the video folks, but it has her email address in it and I don't have it prepared separately. So I don't want to do that. But um, it, you know, she used it to highlight where the markup icon was in a screenshot. So those sorts of things can be super handy. I, I use it constantly for that. Mm -hmm. I used to use something called Skitch back in the day, but now Apple has added, added markup to both Mac OS and iOS. So it's all right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. Uh, all right. Next up is uh, it's a quick tip of mine. It's something it's going to be an obvious thing for many of you, 
Uh, and that's the part of quick tips that we love is that they are obvious once you know to do them. I get to my desk every day and I launch several apps. Uh, mail is usually running, but I have Marco Arment's Quitter uh, quit a bunch of apps when they have gone dormant, especially Safari, because it will just chew RAM if you leave it running for multiple days in a row. And then there's other apps that I, I have it quit or maybe I've quit, you know, the, the day before. I created a keyboard maestro macro called Start My Day. And it launches all of the apps that I would painstakingly go through my dock and launch when I got to my desk every day. And it is super handy. I mean, I've had this is not my first rodeo with these. I have built uh, one for each podcast that I do. So I have a Mac Geek Gab one, a Gig Gab, small business, you know, and uh, I have those here in the studio. So I get all of my stuff up that's specific to each podcast, the agenda document, you know, all of the various web browsers and other utilities that I need logic to do the mixing, all that good stuff. And so I figured this is ridiculous. So I set one up at my desk earlier this week and it has been a game changer like it's just so much easier to just do that and i'm trying to think i guess you could probably do the same literally with shortcuts i don't see why not or, i'm trying to. oh yeah go ahead i mean here well, here's my question for you um login items is typically where you can put an app and it'll start it up but it sounds like you're looking for finer grained granularity is it? Finder, and finder, maybe grain, you grain. don't want to start up every app that you own in logon items. So you so you have a macro that selectively enables the things that you know you're gonna need. Yeah, but it's because I use it when it when I when I wake from sleep in the morning. So login mm. items truly only happens when you log in after a restart, generally. <laughs> right, right. Right. And so this is I'm already logged in. I, you know, I have my Mac auto restart once a week, but other than that, you know, and I and I don't I don't like the idea of having apps start at login. Uh, I mean, some some apps, yes, like things that need to be running in the background. Login items is great for that. However, having it launch like the interactive apps that I use, mail and messages and Safari and all that stuff. I've when troubleshooting, I have. I, I it always drives me crazy when there's 16 apps that want to launch after every reboot and and that can cause trouble, right? So, and I know you can start up with the shift key down. So maybe another a quick tip to go into safe mode, which doesn't launch all those login items, uh, among other things. But uh, with this, it's just I I know that there are certain apps that I want running when I am like starting my work day, and so it's like instead of just going and clicking them, uh, now I I just go to the keyboard maestro menu and I choose start my day, and I could you know assign that to all all manner of triggers. I just happen to choose it from a menu, but. Yeah, so that's I'm sure there's a better way. And like I said, I think I think you could do this with shortcuts too. It's no reason why you couldn't. I just I have keyboard maestro and so it's it's I especially on my Mac, I do not think of shortcuts first. I think of keyboard maestro first. For better and for worse. All right. What do you got next, Mr. Braun? All right. So uh I got a geek challenge from this Dave Hamilton guy. It's true. Imagine that. Um so the challenge was so we're 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 kicking the tires on a new platform now called StreamYard, yep. just uh, to give us options and give you options. But you were like, "How do I get an iPhone to send its content to a window, or or just how do I get iPhone content on the screen integrated with our video broadcast?" And I'm like, "That's a really great question." Great. <laughs> great it was question. great yeah elmer, elmer fudd great. loves it elmer, elmer fudd <laughs> so um so i did a bit of uh, google foo when i found uh something on tech insider or business insider um and there are two ways to do this dave one is new and i'll mention it but it won't work for us but i'll mention it because it's new and i like to talk about new things but so if you now in maverick uh Maver monterey is that, or monterey sorry yeah um Go to sharing there's a new item that i had not seen before because it never was there before and it's called airplay receiver so if you activate that on your mac and then you take for example your iphone and you go to screen sharing and in the uh, control center your mac shows up as a destination the problem is it's all encompassing in that it takes up the whole screen and that's not what we want Oh, interesting. Right. No, that's Yeah, I not tried it. I even want. tried it on my Mac Mini. And when it mirrored, I then got a, a little selector in the upper 
left hand corner of my screen and it's like do you want to put this on the screen or that screen so it's smart enough to know that but the thing is you have no other control Got or at least it. i haven't figured out how to do it okay yeah and then it's it's pretty much you know if you want to watch a video for example on your iphone and do it on your fancy yeah. uh, big screen then that works but for our just purposes, like you would Dave, with an Apple TV, I got it. Yes. Okay, yeah. But you're right with with what I would like to do with with Streamyard here. I I need it in a window. Yeah, exactly. And so here's the other, and you know you'll see the article. Um, here's a trick that I think has been in Mac OS and iOS for a while, but I've I've never really used it. I never had need until now, but now we have a need. And the thing is, if you take your phone and plug it into your Mac, and then you run QuickTime Player. Yes, QuickTime Player. In a nutshell, you say, do a new recording, and then you'll get a pull-down menu showing the potential sources. Well, hey, guess what? If you plug your iPhone in, that's one of them. Yep. And it works perfectly. It's amazing. Um, yeah. So at some point, I'm sure one of us is going to go off on an iPhone thing. Maybe you will in this episode, Dave. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And you can, with most of the uh, screen sharing apps that we have, uh, they give you a choice to display uh, another window. So, so there you go. That's great, perfect. Yeah, no, and, and we've we've shared that tip on the show in the past. I, mm. I, I, it just did not dawn on me, which is why I sent out the geek challenge to you. So, yeah, mm. it worked out. It's good stuff. Fun, and we will. We hopefully we'll be incorporating more of that stuff in our uh, YouTube videos uh, that you will. That you see the little clips and it's not just youtube we put them on twitter and instagram and you know everywhere so yeah uh and even tiktok you can follow backbeat media on tiktok all right uh henry has three quick tips for us uh he says uh here's a quick tip for the apple tv with siri remote if you use restrictions or have a netflix passcode set up you will occasionally be asked for a four digit pin well you can enter that four digit pin simply using your voice. Hold down the Siri button on your Siri remote, which is the button on the side, and then say the four digits. Uh, this works faster than swiping to the numbers with the remote or getting out your phone to type them in. It seems to work wherever the standard four digit pin interface is used. Unfortunately, uh, Amazon Prime Video uses its own five digit interface, so it does not work there. I like it, though. That's good, Henry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, all right. Next tip from Henry. I love and highly recommend spatial audio for watching movies with an Apple TV and AirPod Pros. Uh, it is my preferred way of watching now. And I still get fooled into thinking that the sound is coming from the TV speakers for all to hear. So the thing that I talked about doing on an airplane with an iPad for AirPods Pro uh, and having that sound oriented spatially, you can do with your Apple TV. And so, uh, it, and I can see why Henry would like that. Like, especially, even, perhaps even if you have a, you know, fancy surround sound system, but certainly if you don't, well, your AirPods Pro are the cheapest surround sound system you're going to get. And it is tailored perfectly for wherever you are sitting. And that is key. Uh he does ask, and I was I, I only saw this earlier today, and Lisa was not home, uh, but he does ask if spatial audio works with two sets of AirPods Pro paired to an Apple TV. It could, but I couldn't test it because, A, I didn't have two sets of AirPods Pro at home, and I also didn't have two heads at home with which to <laughs> test. You know, they do say two heads are better than one. I tend to agree. Uh, so Okay, yeah. um, spatial audio only works with the AirPods Pro? Is that Air, correct? AirPods Pro and AirPods Gen 3, the, the latest non-sealing <laughs> AirPods. So Okay, yeah. so they're all in-ear things. Like, So I'm not going to get it on my HomePod Mini. Well, no, because you don't have, you would need, you would need a HomePod Mini surround sound setup, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that doesn't exist yet. Right. So, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it would also work with AirPods Max. Someone will correct me if I'm wrong. Right. Uh, but but I'm I'm pretty sure that that, yes, you get it with that, too. So, yeah, that's pretty good. Oh, and I said uh, so I will test that. But if one of you knows feedback at MacGeekGub.com, that's where you can send in 
answers to our questions to you like this, but also you can ask us questions or share tips. That's how all mm -hmm. of these people thus far have gotten in touch with us. And if you didn't hear them the first time, feedback at MattGeekGab.com. I said feedback at MattGeekGab.com for sure. Uh, believe it or not, we have a new listener, uh, and I need to queue up, uh, I believe it's a him. I think it was John R., but I can't remember the question, uh, who uh, joined us because they heard about us on the Jordan Harbinger show and said, I wasn't sure how to get in touch with you. So for all of you who think that, you know, <laughs> our, our little shtick with, <laughs> with the feedback at MacEcub.com doesn't work. Well, we skipped it last episode or we didn't do it until the end. Uh... And boy, didn't we pay for that. So there you go. One last one from listener Henry. He says, iOS 15's do not disturb in focus acts differently from earlier non-focus versions. In earlier versions, do not disturb could be set to silence notifications and calls only when the phone is locked. But now that option is gone. Notifications and calls are silenced even when your phone is unlocked. So you might be missing calls or notifications that you are expecting. He says, this happens to me when I was logging in to view my credit card balance. They called my phone to give me my two-factor code, but my phone didn't ring because of Do Not Disturb, even though I was literally using it. it took me a day to figure out what was going on. Yeah, good, a good little tip. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, I think I tweaked mine. Um, you would let me know this, I think, in a past episode where I was like, I hate getting notifications, so I silenced them all. Yeah. And you were like, well, dude, you can't see my messages. And I'm like, oh, so if you dig in, yeah, there's a way to allow select apps or individuals to get through. That's absolutely correct. Yeah, that's right. I'm looking. To, I thought we had a question about this later in the episode. And I'm looking. Yeah, Ben. And I will do Ben's question right now. Uh, ben asked uh, just to set it up the right way. He said, uh, I was helping a client troubleshoot a notifications issue on her iPhone running iOS 15.2.1. I don't have much, much experience with focus yet. So I was mystified when she reported that messages was not in the list of apps to follow. That's a weird bug. That's there on all of the devices I've checked. So we'll work with Ben separately on that. But what he did say was we created a custom focus so she can limit notifications to only those connected to her partner intending it to only ring her phone at night when her partner calls. However, with this focus enabled, calls from me still came through. And the reason was that in focus, uh, you can set people or apps or both, right? And so, uh, you know, for example, I talk about the nuclear focus that, that I've created. That's for my family. And in my nuclear focus, I have no apps listed. In fact, I, well, I have it set to allow time-sensitive apps to show, but nothing else. But I do have three people listed. Um, I, I have It's my wife. If you're looking at the video, you'll see that it's my picture. It's because of a weird thing with the way contacts relates our home phone number because we both have the same one. But uh, I have my wife and two kids in, uh, in people, and that's it. But because it knows that they are there, it lets their notifications through in the phone app, in the messages app, in Slack, in Skype, if it has already assigned their contact and linked it to their matching contact in those apps. So that's the trick is if you want to let people through, only add people to your focus. Do not also add if you add you know, if, for example, if I added the messages or the phone app to this nuclear focus, then anyone trying to contact me with either of those two apps would get through. And that is not what I want. So that's the key to this is making sure that you are uh, that, that you understand the difference. It took me a minute, too, because I first did that. I'm like, well, I want him to be able to call me and I want him to be able to message me. So these three people. And, you know, those two apps and then everybody got through. It was like, ah, because I said for those apps to have carte blanche, that's what that means. So just FYI. Yeah. Good, Mr. Braun. Good. Yeah. yeah. The other thing I like is um, I don't think I had it um, enabled initially, but um, silence calls. So if they're not oh. in your contact list, it's just going to show. A notification saying right. well yeah this phone number 
was was if you know i'll give you a notification but i'm not going to ring your phone i'm like thank you very right. much yeah right exactly yeah exactly exactly all right um we might have some more quick tips to share later in the episode we do have more of your questions to get to so i definitely want to make sure we do that the next thing that i want to do john is talk about our first couple of sponsors if that works for you my friend um let's uh let's do it all right hey listen do you ever struggle with like focus energy or motivation if you do well, I think if you've listened to this show for long enough, you know that you are in good company with us here. <laughs> and it's not you. It's your brain, right? Our sponsor thesis will help you take control of your mind to create habits that last and get a little help if you need a boost. Because thesis makes personalized supplement formulas that are specifically designed to boost cognitive function. And it's based on the science of nootropics, which are natural and powerful ingredients. Things like caffeine, ginseng, B12, lion's mane. You've heard me talk about the tea that I like to drink at the beginning of the episodes. They have a lot of the same things in it, but thesis, I've been trying it for a while here. They take the guesswork out because they put together these little packets that are exactly tailored to the things that you want and what you want. And the way you do that is you take their three minute online quiz and thesis will then recommend their high quality nootropic formulas that are unique to you and your goals. Over 60,000 entrepreneurs, lawyers, engineers, busy professionals, podcasters, and parents have used Thesis to get better results at work and at home. Imagine what you could do with Thesis. Well, you don't have to imagine because right now, Thesis is offering you, our listeners, 10% off your first starter kit when you visit takethesis.com slash MGG. Go to takethesis.com slash MGG to take this quiz and discover your unique nootropic combination and save 10% on your first starter kit. That's takethesis.com slash MGG. Make sure to use our URL to make them, you know, so that they know that we sent you our thanks to Thesis for sponsoring this episode. Next up is Bare Bones with BB Edit 14, which brings a horde of new features, changes, and improvements with new significantly deep capabilities for developers and data scientists. But it also offers many features for everyone who works with text. Yeah, I do some development. I do some programming, of course. But I also just work with text on a regular basis. And BB Edit is super valuable to me just for things like comparing documents, even editing stuff in the terminal. Sure, I can use VI or Emacs. You want to know what the end of that flame war is, this decades-long flame war? It's BB Edit because I no longer have to stay in the terminal to edit text in the terminal. I just type BB Edit and boom, there it is. That's how it works. Plus, BB Edit 14 adds built-in support for new languages, R, Go, Rust, Tomo, Arduino, all sorts of things. They've got a note system in there. Uh, for people like me, who used to just create a bunch of untitled text documents to store bits of random data. Now there's notes in there. It's amazing. You've got to go check this out. Go to barebones.com, download BB Edit, test it out for free. You get all the features free for 30 days. Even if you've tried it out before, BB Edit 14 resets that clock for you. You get to check it out, and then you choose whether to buy or not. There's a lot of features that just remain available for free. And then, you know, some of the, the more powerful features, of course, you pay for. Go check it out. Barebones.com. Our thanks to BB Edit for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, let's uh, let's go to Dr. Mac. He's got a question that I think is going to have an answer that many of us are going to want to implement. <laughs> he said, this one's been bugging me for a while, and I hope you have a solution. I like the mail window to fill most of my screen when I have things set up. But when my Mac awakens from sleep or when I reboot, as often as not, the window shrinks and moves off to the left and towards the bottom. I've tried all the usual stuff. Whacking P-lists, safe boot, disc first aid, Onyx, and more. But the issue continues intermittently. Help me, John F., Dave, and Pilot Pete. You're my only hope. John, I have an answer. Because I, too, you am do. very particular about where things are, especially here in the podcast studio, because mm -hmm. I like I have to have our video window like right up at the top so that when I look, I see us and I am also looking at the camera. But I then need our our chapters document off to one side and the other things on this monitor. It's not, you know, 
we all have our spots. I'm, we're, I'm, a, I'm a human, it turns out, and I'm a creature of habit. I use something called Stay from Cordless Dog, and I couldn't live without it. And what you do in Stay is you, uh, what you, well, you run the app, and then you get your windows positioned where you want, and you say, all right, remember these. And it will remember them for your particular layout of monitors. So you could have locations when you are on just, say, your laptop, Right. And then also a different set of locations when your laptop is plugged into a monitor at work. And then another set of locations when your laptop is plugged into a different model of monitor at home. It does it by model number. So, you know, it, it, like it, presumably you could get it confused if you had all the same. But maybe you'd probably want things in the same spot if it was the same monitor. So uh, it, I, I, I love this thing. The only the only time it drives me crazy is if I swap out monitors, like if I upgrade a monitor in the studio and it's like, Oh, hey, look, it forgot everything, but it didn't forget. It's just there, but not there. It's the way to go. I think it's, I don't know, it's, it, I'm going to say it's less than 20 bucks. I think it's, it's far less than that, but um, whatever it is, is it's worth it. So uh, do you, what do you use to solve this problem, John? <laughs> um, I move the window. <clears throat> move the window. Yeah, or I resize right. it. No, but uh, you know, I'm I'm thinking about this though. Is that I had an uh, I I read the question, but I didn't have a really good answer. You you did, but um yeah. I wonder if at the base level somewhere, it's a corrupted cache. Go with me on this. I sure, mean, I could be wrong. But sure, I'm like, but because obviously data is being reloaded from somewhere that screws it up when you start up the app again. And it's like, right. why are you doing this? It's um, saving it somewhere, clearly. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, but, uh, you know, so having a third-party app, which I assume has its own prep files and stuff, uh, takes care of this, so. Yeah, right. Yo, and I see it. Like, I, my when my Windows launch, they go to the wrong place and then stay mm -hmm. immediately grabs them and, and like, <laughs> oh, you know, cool. rank. Yeah, it's cool. I, but, but you're, like, you're right. This shouldn't have to happen the 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 finder is sim it suffers similarly right like when i open a new finder window i want it to be a certain size and i want it in a certain spot and you know we've talked about this on the show over the years the the, the way in the finder that usually works is uh you open a new window you put don't change the folder that it's on change its location and size and then close the window and somehow that is like the magic of of getting the finder to remember. But that doesn't seem to work with that's not a universal thing. So I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think the file that stores this, I think it still does this, Dave. Uh, our old friend dot ds underscore store, I believe is where that. So that may be a, another suggestion is whack that file and maybe it'll yeah, rebuild it and it'll be I don't, okay. I don't think it is for new windows. Um, okay. I think that controls the layout inside the window, hmm. but I don't think it stores the location, the, the, like the, 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 the location of the upper left corner and the size of the window. I, I think, I think it's just what, like, do you have, is it an icon view? Is it in list view? Is it, hmm. you know, I, I'm pretty sure I, I, cause I dug into this pretty deeply a, a while back. Okay. I, I mean, I could be wrong. I mean, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I see some stuff online that suggests that DS store, yeah, let's see, stores custom attributes of its containing folder, such as the position of icons or the choice of, and then dot, yeah. dot, dot, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, stay. It's 15 bucks. <laughs> so, there you go. Uh, you want to take us to listener John? John? Uh, not John John. 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 I'm not John. calling you John John. Um, your both names. All right, so John uh, has some commentary and then a question. So his commentary is, is interesting. Thank you for sharing. Um, I just purchased a new Mac Air M116 processor. Everything is working great. Migration assistant work great moving my apps and files from my old Mac Air uh, 2015 to the new one. Before using migration assistant, my i7 Mac had 90 gigs free on its SSD and 10 gigs purgeable. After migrating my apps and data to my M1 Mac, it now has 195 gigabytes free and 124 purgeable. Any idea why this happened? Um, the other thing I noticed when I ran managed storage on my i7 Mac and the system data size had decreased from 134 to 69. Why did this decrease? Hmm. 
Um, all right, and let's see. So uh, he installed Parallels, okay, and he's running Linux, and uh, that's cool. But my question is, when I was using DisplayPort um, to drive a second 4K monitor, my monitor has both HDMI and DisplayPort, which is better, USB-C to HDMI or USB-C to DisplayPort? So as far as the first thing, uh, all I know is APFS, I, I, I don't trust it. <laughs> As far I, as telling me how much space is available. Yeah, fair. I wanted to make sure we clarified that. I trust APFS. I, the, the Its report of free space is, let's say that it lags lazy. behind reality. I call it lazy. I like it. That's yep. And it, it doesn't kick into gear. Like right now, I actually looked at my MacBook Pro and I have like 30 gigs free. And I'm like, how'd that happen? Yeah. But I think I told you if uh, sometimes running disk first aid from recovery Gives it a little nudge saying, oh, yeah, free this stuff up, dude. Come on. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know the answer to the first question. The second question, Dave, is my experience personally has been, I don't use HDMI. Because <laughs> I've just had so many problems. So I much, uh, my preferred connection, and I found it's a lot snappier, and you typically, I think, get better resolution too, is, so right now I have, uh, for my primary monitor, I'm running a USB-C to DisplayPort cable that I got, I think, from Amazon. Okay. Um, but the, the, the responsiveness of a DisplayPort connection versus HDMI, at least on my Mac Mini, is like night and day. And that it's like, dude, wake up, wake up. <laughs> it's like, Interesting. Nothing's happening. So that yeah. would be my suggestion. And the cable's not expensive. I think it's like 15 bucks or something, or maybe even less. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Right. Yeah, we um, we got an interesting email from listener Neil, uh, who was talking about connections with his. Uh, we're, it was in response to our conversation about monitors last week, and it, I think it supports what you're saying here. Uh, he says he's got the 34 inch LG 5K monitor, which people call the 5K 2K monitor. And uh, he's using it with an M1 Max based MacBook Pro. So um, M1, but different M1 because we're talking about an Air on the on the first one. 16 processor, though. though. I don't know about that. I don't know what that means in, in listener John's email. Anyway, uh, he's got this 14 inch M1 uh, Max MacBook Pro. And he said, when I first connected the monitor to the uh, Thunderbolt port, uh, he connected it on the, to the Thunderbolt port on a, a OWC hub. Uh, the hub was connected to the right-hand side port on, with the laptop open, and that resulted in the monitor's firmware reporting that it was not receiving a full 5K signal. Uh, he found that the monitor was being detected by the Mac as two monitors, one of the correct size, 34 inches, but at a reduced resolution, and a second monitor that was smaller, the second monitor did not allow me to view its details or relocate its position relative to the others in the arrangement tab or anything like that. Um, he says, and the image on the monitor was clearly reduced. He said he then reconnected the hub to the left sided ports and it worked just fine. So he said he shrugged and moved on uh, after about a week or so. He says, I moved the MacBook Pro to clamshell mode and also hooked up a second monitor, a 27 inch 4K monitor. The second monitor was hooked up directly to a Thunderbolt port on the MacBook Pro, uh, and uh, all that worked fine that day. He says he then disconnected the 4K monitor the next morning, and when he woke the laptop, uh, when he woke the laptop via the external keyboard and mouse, so still in clamshell mode, the monitor would only detect in that reduced resolution, regardless of what port it was on. Uh, multiple reboots, forays into displays, preference, power cycling, all that didn't change anything. And so what he found was that with the monitor connected either directly to the MacBook Pro through the hub, laptop open, works fine on the left-hand ports. Right-hand ports get that two-monitor thing. With the monitor connected directly or through the hub in clamshell mode, if there is a second monitor connected, it works fine. If there's not a second monitor, it doesn't work. However, he says, thanks to a suggestion on the Mac Power Users Forum, uh, I switched to the DisplayPort input on the monitor using a Thunderbolt to DisplayPort cable, and boom, it has worked without a hitch since then. So that's bizarre. So he was going Thunderbolt directly to the monitor, and then switching to DisplayPort uh, changed it. But I, I, that doesn't even make sense to me, because I thought 
a Thunderbolt connection would send DisplayPort over the monitor. So clearly there's weird things going on in, in Apple land uh, with all of this. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and, you know, we've got multiple reports of this. This is, it's bizarre what's happening. And I think part of it is whatever Apple is doing with the integrated SOC on, you know, on the, on the various flavors of M1. Uh, clearly there's something about yep. that. Yeah. I mean, the other reflection here in our chat room at live.macgeekab.com slash. Nope. That's it. Just live.macgeekab.com. We'll get you. Ah, there. okay. Yep. Sorry, yep. I forgot. No, it's okay. <laughs> macgeekab.com slash stream is the same place. They, they both put you in the same spot. So, right. Yep. Um, that's where you're So the other thing from. that occurs to me, yeah, so some of the folks in our chat room indicated that HDMI has this thing called HDCP, and it just screws everything up. Uh, mm. High-definition copy protection. And I actually had, uh, the other day, Dave, I had this, and I, I couldn't explain it. Um, so I went to uh, my Apple TV and went to Disney+, Plus, and it's like, uh, yeah, there's an HDCP error, so I can't show you anything. And I'm like, okay, reload, and that fixed it. But... Just that that error came up aggravates me. Yeah. Um, I'm going to assume that DisplayPort is straight digital and they don't have any copy protection, but I could be wrong. No, I think you're right. There is no copy protection there, um, but it shouldn't slow it down. Gosh, yeah. Who knows, though? Who knows? Who knows? I I think there's there's a flip side effect on the... I could be wrong about this. There's something on the Intel Mac minis, which is what you have, right? Mm -hmm. So you connect, you skip HDMI, you just connect DisplayPort and that works better for you? Um, I have one. uh, So my main monitor is DisplayPort and my auxiliary, I think I have that connected as DVI. Your Mac doesn't have a DVI port, so what's it connected to on your Mac would be the question. Like it might oh, I have convert a, a to DV- DVI, USB C to DVI adapter. Okay, so you're going to spl- effectively Display Port to DVI on that one mm. because USB C would be, I think, would be Display Port. I think. I mean, if you go into System Preferences Displays, maybe that's not where it's going to tell us this. No, I don't think that's going to be where it tells us. This. Oh, no, it'll tell us in a system report. In I've exactly. Seen it before, so no, you're system. right. That's the place to go. Yeah, and system information. Yeah, so where would it be? Graphics displays, and it will tell you. Uh, I don't know that it'll tell you. Oh, yeah, yeah, it will. Like on my iMac, it says on the iMac monitor, it says connection type internal. And on my uh, my. Uh, external monitor it says connection type thunderbolt slash display port is what it says so yeah yeah i only see one monitor which is weird in <laughs> in graphics slash displays you only see one it shows intel usb graphics which is what the uh, or uhd graphics which is a uh, okay what they have in this mini but it says dvi or hdmi I'm like okay and that's but in that's my, but it's not showing my internal monitor. Why not? Hmm. You don't have an internal monitor. On or no, no, no. I, I have two external monitors. I don't know yeah. why it's only showing one of them in system report. Hmm. System and that's in the graphics slash displays section. Correct. I wonder is is it possible, John, that your second display is using something like USB to oh, Display wait. Link? Let's go to Thunderbolt. Yeah, that won't. That it, shouldn't show you a display. Or is it connecting to my dock. Hmm. Very strange. Okay. Well, that is very strange. Yeah. I'll have to figure it out. Yeah, because it's it's definitely showing the model number of my secondary monitor. Interesting. And it says it's connected via HDMI or or uh, VI. So. Ooh. All right. Well, don't restart your machine now. But I'm no, curious. no, 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 no. I'm curious if a restart like. <laughs> surfaces more information there that would be mm-hmm. uh that would be interesting uh all right let's see let's go let's go to donna shall we john donna yeah donna donna has, donna has a follow-up um so back in episode 912 we were talking about apple maps suggestions and donna sent in a note 
Um, for quite a while, I received Maps suggestions about where I might want to go. I typically notice it when I get in the car and CarPlay connects. It is a little weird, but it's often correct. There are some restaurants that we go to on a regular regular days for dinner, and I usually visit my mom in the evening. Interestingly, mom's suggestion is for the high school around the corner, not her name and actual address, even though she's in my contacts, and I often use Maps to guide me there. Hmm. So... Um, Thanks for the feedback. And I think in this case, yeah, it is kind of creepy. <laughs> so I, it, it, I, and that these suggestions coming up, it's like, you know, I do this every day. I don't know if I really want you to remind me of it. Like, you know, go to the store or go here or go yeah, yeah. there. I, I, I kind of like it. I mean, when I get into my car, uh, I don't mean to discount that, that it would come across creepy to, to some, but you know, like, when I get into my car on, you know, Wednesday afternoon, which is when I usually go for a quick chiropractic adjustment, my car says, you know, hey, or Apple, I mean, it's Apple Maps via CarPlay says, hey, you want directions to your chiropractor? And I was like, yeah, that's perfect. Great. You know, because I don't even put my chiropractor's address in my calendar. I know where mm -hmm. I'm going. I do it every week. I just put it, I just write Cairo. That's it, you know, and, and it, it gets me there. But, or it, but it's because it knows, right, from my habits. As I understand it, if Apple's to be believed, and I think we can, I'm choosing to believe them in, in this regard, and I think that's a safe choice. All of this information is stored locally on my phone. It's not like the cloud is involved in any of this. But, I and I don't know how to turn it off, but I know that there are things we can do to turn it off. And the reason I don't know how to turn it off is because I don't want it off on mine. But if we go in to, uh, oh shoot, where's my where's my iPhone here? If we go in to settings on the iPhone, right, and then go to uh, Siri and search, this is one place that we could do this, right? And so uh, if you go, you have suggestions from Apple about halfway down uh, on the sort of on the first screen there, and you can uh, have it show notifications with suggestions I'm not sure if this is what it's going to be or not. You're going to need to do some testing on this that because that's just how, because I don't want to turn it off on my phone. So that's one place to do it. But also you get to go down and tell Siri what apps feed it data that it would then suggest from. So if we go down to maps, we can say we can turn off the learn from this app option. Right. Ooh. Right. And and then we can turn off granularly suggestions for this app. Right. So my guess is that this is where you're you're going to want to turn this stuff off uh, is mm -hmm. is there. There's one other place that we might want to look, and that would be in settings, privacy and location services. Right. If you scroll all the way to the bottom and go to system services and then go uh, all the way to the sort of the bottom of that and go to significant locations, you can go in there and then uh, turn off significant locations. My guess is that this also is part of what feeds that little data. So or that little those little alerts and those little notifications. So that's going to be my guess on this stuff. I don't know for certain, but that's going to be my guess on this is where to look. So I don't know. That's. That's how I do it or how I would do it. But I like the notifications and I, I like I the reason I don't find them creepy is because I trust Apple when they tell me that this data doesn't leave my device. So I, I knew I had my iPhone with me when I went to all these places. So it makes perfect sense that my iPhone would know that it was with me when it went to all these places. So there you go. That's how that's how I get to sleep at night. <laughs> Thoughts on any yeah, of that? There's a bunch of I'm, I'm finding like multiple things here i mean one is like go to maps settings siri and search su siri suggestions maps that's where we were yeah you're right yeah uh, and here's the other one let me see privacy look that's and that's the other that's where we were so those are the two places there we go okay yeah. all right good uh good search there yeah yeah it's kind yeah. of a pain you have to go to both places but <clears throat> well i don't think i wouldn't I mean, it depends on what you want to do, but I, I think if you just want to stop the notifications from coming up, then I think just going into uh, the the Siri settings for the Maps app specifically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it would be the the trick there. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're right. You can get there both ways, right? If, um, you know, I got there by going to settings, Siri and search, but I think you can also get there by going to settings, maps, right. and then uh, I think, no, there's no Siri and search there. You have, to, oh no, yeah, right at the top. You go mm -hmm. to Siri and search and then it's the, literally the same dialogue. There's just two different yeah. ways to get to that same dialogue. So yeah, that would be the way to do it. Cool. Um, all right. Listener Ben actually has a question that that flips the script on this far more than I ever expect uh, expected that we would have on this show. But it makes perfect sense for what Ben wants. He says, I'm going on sabbatical this summer and will be cycling across the United States on the Trans Am Westward trip with Adventure Cycling. Besides blogging about my adventure, I'd love for my followers to track my location along the way and would be happy to broadcast it on a public or maybe private website. Is there a website service that I can connect an app to on my iPhone to provide this info and show where I am on some kind of map? I'm assuming, of course, Find My wouldn't permit this, permit this level of transparency. Fair. But if a website had access to the Find My API, I think it would be perfect. I would happily embed such a map on my own website and share the link. So, um... First of all, I'm super uh, I, I, I rarely experience envy because I lead a pretty charmed life and I just like am able to create the things that I want to do. The idea of a sabbatical, however, uh, Ben might have left me a little bit envious. Um, so I, you are you are an inspiration. Let's put it that way. You, you are inspiring me. Maybe someday I, too, will be able to take a sabbatical. Uh, and I totally get what he's looking for. Like this makes this use case makes sense. So I did a little bit of Googling, John. And I found a website called uh, Locato Web, L-O-C-A-T-O Web. And it looks to do exactly what, uh, what he's looking for, which is kind of amazing. Uh, it's an app that you would install on your phone. And you, it shares your position to the web in real time. In fact, that's what it says on the screen. And it's available for Windows Phone, Google Play, and or Google Phones in the Google Play Store, and of course Apple Phones in the App Store. I looked at the app, the website for the app, and checked the uh, the updates, and it was most recently updated on December twenty eighth of twenty twenty one. So it's not like it's you know it, it's it's an active thing, right? It's not like you're the picture of oh, I guess it's just a an Android phone on the site. It looked like the oldest iPhone one could imagine on the site, which is what made me think oh, maybe it's kind of old. But uh, but it's not. It's it's all very up to date. They have a 2022 copyright on the website and it all looks good. So that's where I would start. Of course, if somebody out there knows a better option than locate to web, let us know. Feedback at MacGeekUp.com. <laughs> yeah. All right. What, yeah, you got what else is good for that? Go ahead. What, what did you and I used to use? Glimpse, is it? Glimpse. But that was very much a... Um, you know, share to driving. a specific person. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, but it could. I well, yeah, you might be right. It was just a driving thing, not a like driving a car thing, not driving a different motor vehicle thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, but Glimpse has been certainly for us Apple users. Glimpse has been um, end of life or or uh, usurped, replaced by Apple's just share my thing, right? Because like mm -hmm. that's perfect, right? In the CarPlay interface, you hit. You know, once Maps knows where you're going, uh, you hit share and it shares your journey and ETA with, uh, you know, with with whoever you tell it to. And it's actually a great little interface. I'm assuming it exists without the CarPlay interface, too. I've just I've never used it that way. So, yeah. But yes, PJ in the chat room also says glimpse. So we will we'll put that out there. Maybe that's the maybe that maybe they they would do that, too. Um, yeah, it cool. made me sad when you sent me a notification and I couldn't control your car. It would show me your car, but I couldn't actually influence its behavior, which Same. I think would be a cool additional feature. I agree. I want to be able to give you control of the car so that I can maybe take a nap or, you know, catch up on my email or whatever it is. Maybe watch a movie. That would be great. Why don't they let us do that? That'd be amazing. <sighs> All right. You want to take us to Roy, John? I'm going to take us to Roy. So Roy asks, is there a way to make a shortcut to turn on and off Bluetooth on the iPhone 2? I think he's he means iPhone 13. Okay, um, sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't think there's an iPhone 2 Pro, but uh, I think he means the 11 out. Pro is what he's asking. Oh, 11 Pro, would, okay. That's how I would read that. But, but he used certainly. Like, he didn't use he would, numbers. He used, he used Roman numerals. He used two eyes. That's right. Yes. <laughs> there we go. We're the only um, ones that can see it, though. And Dave, the, the answer I have for this, so I, uh, again, I whipped out the Google Foo, and uh, I found something I didn't know about. Um, so my first thought was, well, just go to Control Center, because there are Bluetooth and uh, uh, Wi-Fi icons in Control Center, so why not turn them off from there? The problem with this, Dave, is I found this magical video. Um, who is the... Uh, hold on, here you go. Uh, Eddie Wu will link to the video, but he he did a lot of homework here. And the okay. thing is, Dave, did you know that clicking on the things in the control center doesn't actually turn the radio off? It's true. Yeah. Do I you... did not know this. And he actually, in his video, so it's an excellent video, and he shows this. He's like, yeah, check this out. I turned it off in control center, and then I go to the uh, settings control panel, and it's still on. What? Yes. But it's because not connected to anything. That's, so, and that's what it says in Control Center. When you tap the Wi-Fi icon in Control Center, it sa it changes to not connected, not mm -hmm. disabled. However, a as you said, yeah, and you can you can get to the Wi-Fi settings uh, in, uh, you know, in iOS just by go by tapping, holding again on the Wi-Fi icon, and then tap Wi-Fi mm -hmm. settings. That brings it up, and you're right. It it's but then you can turn it off. And then if you go to control center, you will see Wi-Fi off. That's right. Yep. Yeah. So he uh, has a dandy video that shows how to build a shortcut to do this properly. So really? Oh, so you can wait. So a shortcut can, can turn uh, it's oh right. Of course. Yeah. I have one of those, John, believe it or not, because mm. I, I, uh, want my Wi-Fi to be off while I am using, um, while I'm driving in my car. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I have it set to use CarPlay, and I swear I'm going to find it in here. I, 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 I'm I looking on my shortcuts here so I can find the, the one, but and it, it, like, it happens all the time on my phone. Why can't I find this? It's crazy. But I have it set using CarPlay as a trigger, to um to turn off my wi-fi and for some reason i cannot hmm. find it on my phone this is amazing like I, it I, it does it every day when i or hmm. not every day because i don't get in my car every day but this is bizarre oh you want to know why because i have it as an automation that's why so there you go uh but yes it would be the same thing and you can set wi-fi and turn it off which is very different than um than disabling or disconnecting from your network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Cool. I like it. Very good. Very good. Very good. Um, all right. We have, I don't know if we have, we might have time for another question or two, but we certainly have time for your favorite section, which is cool stuff found. So we will do that uh, next, but well, we'll do it next, next. The next thing that I want to do, if uh, we're good here, John, is I want to talk about our next two sponsors. Fantastic. All right. Hey, who doesn't love to live well, to be perfectly at ease, in comfort, and in style? Hunter Douglas, our sponsor here, can help you do just that with their innovative window shade designs, gorgeous fabrics, and control systems so advanced they can be scheduled to automatically adjust to their optimal position throughout the day. This is cool. This is geeky stuff that makes your home look good. And does some other cool things because the superior insulation in the Hunter Douglas shades keeps you warmer in winter, cooler in summer, and helps lower your utility bills, right? And how about just that moment when you walk into a room and everything about it just looks right and feels right? And then there's Hunter Douglas's Power View Technologies, which is just what you use on your phone so that your shades can be set to automatically reposition for the perfect balance of light, privacy, and insulation morning, noon, and night. 
these things look amazing and I am stoked to check them out at some point here and you can do it too. Visit hunterdouglas.com slash MGG today for your free style get smarter design guide with fresh takes, creative ideas and smart solutions for dressing your windows. That's hunterdouglas.com slash MGG for your free design guide and our thanks to Hunter Douglas for sponsoring this episode. Next up, we've got a bit of an unusual sponsor for this episode, and that is The Jordan Harbinger Show, which is a podcast that I am loving over here. And I am telling you that you are going to love The Jordan Harbinger Show. The reason is, you know, we're here to answer your questions and, and help show you things that help your technological lives, right? Well, The Jordan Harbinger Show is about the same sort of thing for everything that's not technology. I mean, he talks to some folks who are technologists, but he talks to all kinds of people with the goal of pulling in useful, practical insights out of all the people that he interviews. He's organized some of his episodes into little starter packs. Things like, you know, you want to learn about communication. Good. He's got a pack about that. You want to learn about criminal justice and law enforcement. He's got his pack of interviews about that. Cults, scams and conspiracies. I love that kind of stuff. Debate and negotiation, entrepreneurship and investing, failure and resilience, all kinds of great things. We really enjoy this here, and I think you will as well. There's a lot to like. Check out jordanharbinger.com slash start for some episode recommendations or search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Our thanks to The Jordan Harbinger Show for sponsoring this episode. All right. Cool stuff found time, my friends. Let's oh, go. Man. Let's start with Larry and see how far we get. Larry uh, accidentally shared a cool stuff found with us. He found a website called printatestpage.com. And it is exactly what you think it is. <laughs> it's a web page that generates either a black and white or a color uh, test page for your printer but the cool part about it is that it like the 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 black and white one it's just you click on it and it, it pulls up a, a pdf but it'll have like gradients and different text sizes and things like that so that you can you know you can see what's going on the color one has uh you know red green and blue lines and then also the also the same black and white gradients and then a couple of pictures of like fruit and, and like different colored bottles and things like that so that you really get a feel for what it's like to test your printer. So, yeah, print test page dot com. Thanks, Larry. Good stuff. <laughs> he uh, poor Larry was having trouble getting his printer to print right. And he found this along the way, which I think is great. So just pulls pulls open a PDF and you're good to go. Fun, huh? Indeed. You want to take us to Todd? Yes, Todd helped me solve a mystery. <clears throat> All right. So let's see here. Because we were talking in the last episode, you shared as a cool stuff found from Todd, Devin's uh, word service app, right? To to show some different services in the in the Mac OS services menu. But yeah, and I was like, well, I'm not too impressed because it only showed two options. And he's like, no, no, no. Here's what you gotta do. And I didn't know this, and I don't know if this is default behavior with apps that go in the services menu or not. But in my case, yeah, I only saw two of them. As it turns out, Dave, there's like probably like 20 or 30 tasks that it can perform. Um, but here's where you got to go. System preferences, keyboard, shortcuts, services. And the and thing then... is, you're probably going to see, or at least I did, only two of them were checked. That's why I only saw two of them, but there's tons more. So if you install something that resides in the services menu, here's a tip. Look in this spot in system preferences and you can expose all of the functionality. I like that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it, and and it I think it I think it is and is correct that it is the default behavior because if an app, you know, like you said it it adds 20 services you want to just narrow down that menu to the one or ones that you use so that you could have 10 different apps that provide you with services, but you don't wind up with, you know, 200 items. You just choose the ones that you like and you're off to the races. Ah, that's pretty good. I like it. 
Yeah. yeah, and actually, I should clean mine up because I have like a I, I use graphic converter and it has like a ton of things there, and I'm like, do I ever really use this? No, right. not really. So. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're. Yeah, I need to clean up mine too. <laughs> yeah, it's good. That, that's a that's a good little tip. That's great. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, John. Um, let's see. Mike found Mike found something. I, I I don't know if any of us will uh will wind up buying this, but the its existence is cool, and it is Fairphone at Fairphone.com. This is uh, only available, I believe, in the EU right now, or in yeah yeah in the EU. Well, throughout Europe. I don't want to say EU because there's some political lines drawn that don't necessarily fit. Uh, they are no longer the same. But uh, but he says uh, it, it's an Android phone. And the concept is that all the parts are user replaceable and it comes with a five year warranty. So okay. it's built to be this sort of environmentally, uh, you know, friendly phone that. Uh, you know, it's and, and guaranteed for five years, right? So I, you know, and I, my guess is that I think five years is the the insides are going to like the CPU and stuff is going to you're going to want something new after five years, but being able to replace it and or not replace it but repair it, I think that's pretty good. Like it's a it's a neat idea. We, we don't get it here in the U.S. for you and me, John, but um, our our Europe listeners. Certainly could uh, could could get one. Yeah, UK, Netherlands, Austria, and everything in between. So fun stuff. I like it. It's good. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate you sending that in. Um, yeah. So let's talk to Barry here, or let's let Barry share his thoughts about uh, external monitors and such, because I, there, there's there's things for us all to learn here. So Barry says, I listened to episode 913 when listener Jim had a question about his favorite or our favorite 27 inch monitors. He says, I've had a 2015 iMac for quite a while, but it's been in storage since the M1s came out. It's unfortunate since there is no target display mode that would allow me to use it as an awesome external display. Yeah, that's true. The target display mode went away with retina screens because there was uh, no way to get that amount of bandwidth in to the Mac to the display. Uh, or so we were told. Uh, he says, there is a solution that I've tried recently that's working very well. It's called Luna Display, L-U-N-A Display, from astropad.com. One of its primary purposes is to allow an iPad to be used as a second screen for your Mac. However, that has been partially Sherlocked by Sidecar, of course. Luna Display also works really well Mac to Mac, uh, or even Windows to Mac. Both Macs need to run Mac OS 10, 11 or later, and it will run software on each side to display properly. Note that the displays can be a bit slower to refresh uh, than native, and at 5K, there is the caveat of only 45 hertz refresh rate. But it looks gorgeous to me and is really nice that I can still use this machine as a great big high-res second display. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. We'll put a link to uh, to Luna Display there in the show notes. Um, that 45 Hertz, I think it's, and I'm, I'm speculating here, John, but bear with me on this. I don't think the refresh rate of the screen gets lowered to 45 Hertz. I think the refresh rate of the image being sent to the screen is maxed out at 45 Hertz. So I don't think you're going to get like weird issues with your lighting conflicting with the display. I think you still get the display's native refresh rate, but you're just like, you're not probably not going to be happy sending games to it or things like that, that would need faster refresh. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. So. But, nice. Uh, right. I'm almost certain I've seen an ad for this in one of my, uh, I think Instagram. And it was like, Oh, remote display. That's cool. Yeah. As long as you can keep up. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and that's it, is it can keep up with simple things, uh, but probably not what you're going to want to use for gaming or things like that. But, you know, I mean, look at what we all, well, look at what I use my secondary monitor for. It's where I put, like, my chat apps. I'll put some, like, you know, if I have activity monitor open or something, I'll have that over there. I use a thing called Garage Pay to track our PayPal stuff. And so that sits on my secondary monitor at, at, down in the office. 
you know, so it's it's super handy, and I definitely like to have messages and Slack and all that stuff open. But it's I'm not I don't like 45 hertz. Like fine, whatever. It's all good as long as it as long as it works. So yeah, I kind of like that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I do like they it. Have no, nah, they don't really go into detail about the wireless technology they're using. No, no, they don't. Yeah, 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 <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I mean, all, all they right. say is, yeah, available for USB-C, HDMI, and mini display port. Okay, that's nice. Yeah, it's good, right? Yeah, exactly. Or maybe yeah, it's it... buried in there. I'll, I'll, I'll have to poke around. Okay. Because I'm curious, what are they using? Right. You know, their own thing or, or what? I, I think it is their own thing. Yes, I, I, I think the, the way that it works is, yeah, they're, it's their own thing. But, mm -hmm. yeah, it's cool. Uh, you want to, uh, you want to take us? You have a cool stuff found that you found, John. I have a cool stuff found that I put it on my wish list, but nobody bought it for me. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to buy it for myself because there I got go. a gift card. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you about the other thing I ordered. But dude, this device is so cool. So I don't know about you, Dave, but over the years, I've accumulated shirts where one or more buttons fall, fall off. And Say it ain't so. Yes. <laughs> and the thing is, you know, I mean, you don't want to, you know, be flashing people and stuff like that. So, and yes, I have needles, I have thread, but I find it a chore to to sew a button back on. You know, my eyesight's kind of going and I can't get the needle in there. And it's like, what if somebody made a machine that does this? And somebody does. Ooh. The Singer Button Fast Quick Fix Button Replacement Tool. All right. And you literally, so you, um, so it comes with these little uh, doohickeys, I'll call them. Sure. <laughs> that you put in the gun. It has a needle. You then put it through the shirt. You put a button on top of it, and then you pull the trigger on it, and it injects a thing. On one end, it's like a little round thing, so it doesn't fall out. And the other thing, it's like a little T that it pushes through. But it's just so brilliant. Huh. Yeah. It gives you the mechanical advantage you need. I like it. 20 bucks on Amazon. Yeah. Oh, put a link in the show notes to that. I like it. That's good. Yeah, man. because it's just I, I was just so sad because I have some really nice shirts, Dave. You know, I'm still a Hawaii. I mean, even, you know, for those that are watching on video, I mean, check this thing out. I just put the button back in. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad that this shirt that you're wearing has 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 uh has been granted new life, my friend. Yes. That's outstanding. <laughs> and you don't have to flash us for that to happen so yeah <laughs> this is this is outstanding i like it yeah well i don't flash you either. I, I don't want to flash you either so. right no 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 it's it's appreciated all the way around this is a win-win that's right yeah uh all right i have i have a couple more quick tips depending on how quickly these guys will probably wrap it up for us but um i've been using a very quickly installed ios 15.4 beta when i found out that it had the um Unlock with with mask without Apple Watch required to be on your wrist. Now, this is amazing because a, almost exactly a year ago, I installed the uh, iOS beta, whatever it was at the time, so that I could get the Apple Watch unlock with with the, the mask on. Right. And that was a game changer. I mean, a total game changer. But I like wearing my mechanical watches and I basically stopped wearing any of my mechanicals over the last year because of exactly this, you know? And, and so I was super stoked to, uh, to, you know, to, to be able to, to dig in and see how this works. Plus it's not just unlock that this now allows. I can use Apple pay with this. It'll work for one password, right? Cause it's a, it's a face ID unlock and it, it you go through a process of setting it all up you um, you don't have to wear a mask while you're doing it, but it will do sort of a secondary look at your face and you can do it with and without glasses. So I did that because I, I wear glasses when I drive is really what it is that and watch TV. But, uh, you know, so I went through that whole process and it took me a couple of days to get it to where I can reliably get it to work. And the trick is, of course, this makes perfect sense as soon as you, you hear it and you probably already figured it out is it's all about your eyes. So if I make sure that like my eyes are open and I'm looking at my phone, the unlock happens as seamlessly as it does when I don't have a mask on. But if I'm, you know, if my gaze is distracted or my eyes are maybe squinted or something, it like it takes a little extra longer. It still works. 
But it's that whole like I'm going to intently stare at my phone and then boom, the unlock happens. And it uh, like I'll say it works. It's like it's now to the point where I don't even think about it, uh, even if I happen to be out wearing a mask or whatever. So um, which is great. Okay. I mean, it, so go ahead. No, I look forward to that because the thing is, so um, as of late, you may have noticed that, you know, I got a little more hair on my face here. Sure. Um, but my face ID was not working reliably. And the thing is, face ID, at least uh, on my current OS, has an option of you taking one picture and then another picture. And I'm like, well, let me take one with my glasses on and one with my glasses off and maybe we'll figure it out. But consistently, if I try to log into my phone and I'm in bed and I don't have my glasses on, um, it, it probably fails about 75% of the time. Interesting. Huh. Well, because they have the I... ability already to have multiple profiles. Why aren't they smart enough? And then when I'm out and about in the store, it almost always automatically, when I try to do an Apple Pay, um, it oh, almost fair. immediately says face ID. And then it's like, nope, give me the passcode. Because yeah. it probably knows, okay, you're wearing a mask. Well, you should. So I, I, I recommend out. putting the beta on. I know that sounds crazy, yeah. but like it has been up until I came across it in my notes for the show here. I forgot that I was running beta software on my phone. It has been super stable. Nothing's been weird. Of course, I say that now, and that, like nice. this weekend, my phone's going to be a disaster. Or something. Yeah, but right, <laughs> but uh, but no, it really has. Like it's been completely fine. Uh, so yeah, so my guess is, of course, by the time this gets out, most of the um masking requirements i don't know how quickly apple's going to get this out it took them forever to get the the version with the watch out like that was months i remember because i started i put it on the first day of rehearsal i did a show called next to normal last winter and i was like well, i'm going to be in the theater like four days a week so uh, you know and we were wearing masks except when i was like literally sitting at my drums mm -hmm. this was all pre-vaccine and all this stuff and uh and I knew that like having my phone unlocked with my watch would be huge. And it was. So that's why I put it on. Like I said, last year, and I think the iOS, whatever version it was that had that feature wasn't released until that like two and a half month run of that show ended or right near the end of it or something. So I don't know how long they're going to take with this. It, if they take two and a half months, I think most of the masking requirements are going to be gone, but maybe that's just wishful thinking for me, but it certainly seems like, a lot of places are targeting into March for uh, as the sort of, you know, last the, the ones that are holding out. But anyway, we'll we'll see the. Um, the next thing is an interesting thing, John. It, th there's a conspiracy. I know, <laughs> I, but I have a theory here and I'm pretty I'm pretty sure it's true. No one has been able to confirm it for me. And this is the even weirder part. Uh, our most recent example of this. Uh, actually led to us, you mentioned earlier in the episode, we changed, and for this episode, for the first time, we're using a platform called StreamYard to do our call between us for the show, as well as uh, streaming it to, you know, YouTube and Facebook and, and all of those things. And the reason we moved to StreamYard, I think we're going to stay here because it it is a way better platform than what we were using for Melon. But the reason we moved to StreamYard is we were having a problem with Melon, and we submitted a support request, and we got no answer. And this was the case, like we've been with them for six or seven months now or whatever, maybe longer. And I've submitted other, we have submitted other support requests and nothing, like just no answer. And it's like, well, that's not cool. But this most recent one was about video quality and it was really something that we wanted to get to the bottom of. We found some very specific weird things you couldn't upload to them. Like it was obvious there was a major problem. And so I, I, I like... I reached out on Twitter. I replied to them and and finally got a DM from uh, one of their support reps who was like, yeah, look, we, you know, what's your case number? You know, what's your email that's attached to? And I'm like, oh, it's our, our feedback at MacGeekUp.com email. And they're like, okay, yeah, look, here's the, they, they like copy and paste it in a DM on Twitter. Like, here's the reply you got. I'm like, no, we didn't. And I checked everything. And what's interesting is to log into the service, you have to, uh, you give your email. There's no like we don't even have a password for these things. Right. Uh, we type in our email address. It sends us a link to click or a code to type in or something. You know, it's one of those deals. And then we log in. So clearly they are able to send us email, but not their support system. And I told them, I said, well, you know, send it to my personal address. And boom, email came through instantly. And so it was like, OK, wait a minute. I've seen this before. 
in my in my uh, you know personal life because I have one of those. Uh, I years ago standardized on. I thought I was really smart, and for a while I was until I outsmarted myself. Uh, I decided I would use you know I have my Dave the Nerd domain, so I thought well I'll use an email address of orders at Dave the Nerd dot com as the address that I use for like all of my accounts, like my, you know, if I like things like Amazon, I don't even know if I use it for Amazon, but you know, that sort of thing, like Amazon or when I'm making a purchase. So and like my, all my hotel, like websites, I use orders and stuff. And it was just a great way to know that if I wanted to, you know, compartmentalize things, I had it that way. Ticketmaster was that way. And Ticketmaster was the, actually it wasn't uh, Marriott was the first one where I just stopped getting email receipts from them. And it was like, what's going on, guys? And they're like, no, we're sending them out. We show that it's sent. And I'm like, didn't make it. And they're like, check your spam filter. I'm like, it's not the spam folder, you know. Um, and went round and round with them. And I said, hey, just change it. Instead of orders at, send it to Dave at. Ev literally everything else is going to be the same, right? Because it's the same mail server. It's going the same way, like same domain, all the same filtering and all that. Instantly it came through. And I'm like, aha, OK, weird. Why are you blocking that? Why don't you know that you're blocking that? And then about a year and a half later, Ticketmaster, same problem, same address, had them change it from orders at to Dave at. Boom. I started getting all my ticket confirmations and all that stuff again. You know, they were working in the past and they stopped. And now this one feedback at no Dave at yes. I have a theory <laughs> that there is some heuristics database it actually it's heuristics is the wrong thing it's just a list where if you have a word a, like a, a dictionary word to the left of the at sign in your email address it filters it out thinking we don't want to be spammers and the only people that mm -hmm. would use an address like this would be you know spammers or honeypots or whatever so we're just not going to send it but the problem is now three different companies, one of which is, is like Mellon, like they're a super geeky company with everything they're doing. They have no, like none of them are getting notifications in anywhere that anyone knows to look that these addresses are causing things. They don't bounce because they're not getting a bounce back. It just goes into a black hole and that's not good. So these people will never know that they, that this is happening to them. You have to suss it out. So my advice is my quick tip that definitely is not quick because it just took me five minutes to walk <laughs> through all of this is do not use an email address with words to the left of the at sign. That's my that's my advice. And that's why. I don't know. That's what mm. I got. Right. I Weird, know, man. You can avoid that. So uh, well, but what you're saying by... is that suspect words. So words that are spammy like. I I mean orders the the uh, some server sure. along the way says nope. Yeah, but I just... it, but I don't think it's some server. I think it is the outbound. I don't even think it's the mail server. I think it's the engine that would be delivering the message to the mail server, right? Like so Ticketmaster's because Ticketmaster's mm -hmm. customer service, their email gets to me, right? Mm -hmm. Mellon's uh, two uh, two factor authentication gets to me, but the customer service doesn't. Right. Same with Marriott. The customer service gets to me, but the order, the order confirmations don't. And like I get it that the especially big companies, but it, all of us, if you are running a mail server, you need to be very careful that your server, your outbound server, does not flag too many of your messages as spam or get reports of your messages mm -hmm. as spam. Because if that happens then you get shut down. And if your email, if your business relies on getting emails out to people like say Ticketmaster or Marriott's does, then you yeah. don't want to get caught that way. I know. As of late, I've had a lot of things. So for example, Dave, our, um, the invite to StreamYard mm -hmm. was put in my spam folder. I'm like, dude. But it got to you. That's very different. Yes. Like, no, I understand. Uh, right. Versus some server just deciding to dump it. And it's like, well, that's not cool, dude. I mean, you know. Yeah. Yeah, error. this is just a black hole. Like mm -hmm. no, you know, and and like our Mac Geek Gab email, we use MailRoute as a as a front door for that before mm -hmm. it ever gets to Google, which is what actually manages our email. And one thing I love about MailRoute, it's it's crazy, right? But it's it's cool, is you get to see everything. There is nothing hidden from us. So mm -hmm. if it makes it to MailRoute server, we see it. Now MailRoute may decide. Ah, this is spam. We're going to put it over here or put it over here. Like they've got three buckets. 
but we get to look in those buckets and see everything. Yeah, you can recover it if you want to. You're like, yeah, exactly. I'll whitelist this. Yeah, that one so, I want. Yeah, and I So at least the human route. is in the chain to make a human decision, not... Correct. Yeah. Throw it all away. Yeah. Yeah, so I, Brian Monroe in the, in the chat is saying, yeah, it, you know, it, it seems like there's a blacklist on certain keywords, and I think that's exactly right. It, of course, if I had read that, you know, seven minutes ago, we could have shortened this whole segment, but, uh, you know, but I didn't, uh, he says he's seen something like this before where emails just never get there. And that's what it is. And the problem is, like I said, the, so I'm sure someone at these companies it, chose to implement this stuff. Right. But no one knows that it's been implemented. So like the support staff, like I remember dealing with Ticketmaster, I got pretty high up at Ticketmaster, because I'm like, I bought, I'm buying a crap ton of tickets from you, and I'm not getting the the email confirmations, which I like because I put it, I use those, and I put it into TripIt. Like it makes my life way easier. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you know, they like I got pretty high up, and they're like, yeah, it's like, I, like we're not seeing a bounce. I'm like, I believe you, but you, you know, I hope you believe me too. And then when we just changed it, you know, we just changed the the word or the letters to the left of the at sign, and as soon as we did. Boom, they got through. So fascinating stuff. I don't know. Now I'm exhausted. Now we're. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Where are we at? Speaking of email. No, nope. no, no, we're we're, done. we're at. Yeah, we're way past. We the have end some of the show. email head scratchers. We do. We coming do. up in the next exciting episode. Yeah, yeah we'll cue those up for the next one for sure. All right. Yeah, I thought that last we're, we're at like an hour 20. I thought that last tip would take like a minute, but obviously mm -hmm. I've been wanting to get this off my chest well, you for gotta five explain years. It. Well, you have to explain it. I agree. Yeah, no, it's good. Too. It's good. It's good. All right. But I'd be curious to hear from any of you if you've experienced this kind of weirdness, because I think it's happening pretty widespread. Hmm. But again, I don't know how many of us are using. I, my guess is more and more of us are going to start using our own, email, you know, custom addresses at custom domains because Things like Apple are making it easy and this, all that stuff. This could explain, Dave, why I'm not getting the emails that I used to from a Nigerian prince who wants to give me millions of dollars. Dude, that's going to be like, that's your <laughs> retirement. That's the key <laughs> to unlocking your your huge future of, of financial freedom. Uh. <laughs> no, it's not. Speaking of your financial freedom, check out MacGeekUp.com slash merch and uh, and use some of your financial freedom to get yourself a nice T-shirt that says don't get caught on the front and uh, and has our Mac Geekab logo on the back. Very exciting stuff. I'm super stoked about it. And uh, yeah, every the ones that are coming out now are good. And these shirts are soft and cushy and cozy. I love it. It's great. So yeah, I wish... My order didn't get put in my spam folder, which it did, Dave. I'm like, oh, come on, man. I'm like, of course it did. Where did I get? Yeah, they're like, we'll send you a confirmation email. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. I'm like, where is it? Oh, it's it's there. Yeah. But at least it got to you. So there's that. They're not they're not yes. filtering it out. So mm -hmm. craziness. All right, that's what we got, folks. Make sure to check out our sponsors at macgeekab.com slash sponsors. John, you got anything uh, else to share with the the fine folks out there? Um. The Twitters are always fun. I am John Efron. He's Dave Hamilton. There's also Pilot Pete, who we've been seeing more of lately, which is awesome because Pilot Pete is awesome. I got a text from him about 30 minutes ago saying he was just available, and it was like, oh, man. If we weren't just on StreamYard for the first time, I probably would have just said, yeah, join in. It'll be fine. But we don't know that it'll be fine. Um, you know, so I didn't want to interrupt the flow of the show. So... Uh, I mean, I like the interface. I mean, it's, uh, oh, it's, it's similar great. to the other guys. Yeah. Um, I, I don't see anything like, you know, earth shatteringly different between oh, them. The, but the earth shatteringly different thing is that you and I both get to be co hosts. Ah, oh, right, right. Right. Control. And, Before you gave me control, and, you know, that's just a terrible idea. Well, you didn't do anything with it. So it was like, <laughs> well, we got to we gotta get things rolling here. But yeah, I like it. I, and I like the consolidated chat interface, and uh, it's mm -hmm. nice. It's good. I linked up a bunch of their key. They 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 have keystrokes. That's also different mm. to change things. And I've linked them up to some keyboard maestro macros, so I can like change the view of things just on my keyboard. Ooh. There, it's great. Wow, look I at love you it. go. I know, man. I'm telling you, I send you the keyboard maestro script, 
And you have a license for Keyboard Maestro. If you don't, just ask. I do. Like, we, we, yeah, we have a we have a license. So oh, use Keyboard right. Maestro. Yeah, man. I'll send it to you when we're done with the show. How's that sound? Great. Let's wrap the show up first, shall we? All right. Uh, yeah, it's a check out our sponsors. I told you about that. Make sure to check out the sponsors from this episode. Of course, the Jordan Harbinger Show, which you'll find wherever you get your podcast. Takethesis.com slash MGG. Uh, barebones.com for BB Edit. And HunterDouglas.com slash MGG to get your free Style Get Smarter design done. So I know that my shirt says it, but if you're not watching, then you're going to need to know this special advice. So we need to make sure we deliver that audibly, too. So we will do that, and we will see you next time. Made up.